Welcome to all of you and a special thank you to the presenters at the Maine History Festival which just concluded next door at the Collins Center for the Arts. My name is Liam Reardon and I'm a professor of history here at UMaine and I will serve as the MC for the keynote event of the Maine Bicentennial Conference. As many of you know, we have two incredibly talented early American historians as our main speakers this evening. And to get us started on our best footing, we have representatives from the University of Maine and the Penobscot Nation to offer a few remarks to get us underway. So first, Jeff Hecker, Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost of the University of Maine. Well, thank you, Liam. And uh, thank you all. Welcome to the University of Maine. We're so pleased to have you here. We're so pleased to have the opportunity to host uh, the Maine Statehood and Bicentennial Conference. Uh, it's, um, I hope, uh, that you, while you've been here and you've been absorbing things and learning interesting things, you've also taken a little bit of time to enjoy our beautiful university, which is your land-grant uh, university. You know, we celebrated our uh, 150th anniversary a few years ago and, and spent a, quite a bit of time reflecting on uh, our origins and, and our purpose and, and the mission of the university. And while it's risky to talk history in front of a, a group of people, of, of student historians and people who are passionate about history, uh, I hope you bear with me briefly. So, so we, you know, we spent a lot of time on it. And of course, you all know that, that you know, as a land-grant university, University of Maine uh, was created uh, when President uh, Lincoln uh, signed the Morrill Act in 1862. Uh, and you think about that, in the middle of the Civil War, uh, having the forethought to think about creating that the, how the nation could benefit from the creation of universities. They're there to educate, uh, to produce new knowledge, and to serve their states. And as a land-grant university, of course, that's, that's in our DNA, to serve the state. We started, of course, with agriculture and the mechanical arts uh, in 1865. But our, our portfolio, as I'd say, has expanded uh, dramatically in that 150 years to include uh, the uh, physical and natural sciences, uh, the social sciences, the visual and performing arts. But that, that uh, core part of our mission of serving the state pervades all of these areas. Uh, that one of the things that I, I'm quite proud of at the university is that regardless of the discipline, all of our faculty are focused on our state in some ways. How does the work that they do uh, enrich and, and advance uh, our state? And while we're known for engineering and, and forestry, uh, and maybe marine sciences, uh, you know, we also have a powerhouse uh, of uh, intellectual power in the, uh, in the humanities and the arts and the cultural areas. And so we have a strong commitment to uh, sharing in those areas as well, partnering with other people and other institutions around the state who share our commitment and love for uh, culture, uh, for history, uh, for, uh, for the arts. And I think this, uh, this conference is a, is a wonderful example of that, and we're quite proud of, uh, of being able to pull this thing together and provide a focal point for people who share the same kind of passion that we have uh, for our state. I'm going to use this opportunity to thank Liam Reardon uh, for his leadership in creating uh, this conference. Uh, he, uh, he's had a lot of help, but uh, he's also uh, been the leader and uh, the, the, the driver and the, the little engine that could, uh, that's made this, uh, this occur. So thank you very, uh, very much. So once again, welcome to your, uh, your land-grant university. I hope you'll enjoy this evening. Thank you. So it's a fact of profound significance that the University of Maine is located on Penobscot tribal homeland and so close to the long-standing center of the Penobscot Nation on Indian Islands. So it's my great honor to introduce Molly and Dana the tribal ambassador for the Penobscot Nation to also offer a few words of welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I like to start off 
uh, in my native language when I give these land acknowledgments and welcomings, so I, I'll translate it right after. And this may be a touch longer than a traditional opening, but I speak for a lot of people, so I hope you indulge me. Clay, Indiliwizi Maliandena, Meganujayao Bonawapskewik, Gamaj Nolas Waltam, Elia Pachipep Sidewen. I said hello, my name is Maliandena, I am from the Penobscot Nation, and I am very thankful that we're all gathered here. As Maine celebrates 200 years of its statehood, it serves as a space for all Mainers to reflect, learn, share, and express what this occasion means to us individually and collectively. As an indigenous woman born and raised in this state, I likely have a perspective that would not historically be shared in spaces such as this. I do not ever take it for granted that I am able to speak and be heard. I stand on the shoulders of my silenced ancestors who fought wars for a country that did not allow them to vote, who watched their land, resources, culture, and families torn from them, who sacrificed so much so that I could not, I could not only be here, but also know my identity as a Penobscot person. They prayed hard that we would not disappear, and in everything I do, I keep in mind that my life is their prayers answered. We are here to commemorate the Bicentennial of Maine. This comes with mixed feelings for myself and other Wabanaki. Our ties to this land existed long before America was dreamed of. The artifacts, oral traditions, legends, and historical records all point to thousands of years of Wabanaki being here in our homeland. So to wrap our heads around a bicentennial celebration, we need to acknowledge those mixed feelings and the intergenerational trauma but also look to the future and how to best move forward in our current social and government systems. We maintain our indigenous communities and life ways and are also neighbors now to cities and towns in Maine. There are many individuals, organizations, governing bodies, schools, and universities such as this one that have realized the only way to understand the full scope of being from Maine is to be aware of not just the history, but the effects of that history throughout the generations. I cannot stand before you this afternoon and be a complete cheerleader for the Bicentennial. My people endured generations of attempted genocide, broken treaties, racism, disease, addiction, and all the spokes in the wheels of colonial oppression. However, the silver lining is that I can stand here as a testament to the power of shared humanity. I can stand here in front of your listening ears and open hearts with the knowledge that we have come so far and we have the power to keep going. I can stand here in the state of Maine that just this year has replaced Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. Yeah. <laughs> And you know what's coming next. <laughs> and has banned the use of Indian mascots for sports teams. I can stand here and have you see me as human as everyone else, and that would not have happened 200 years ago. I can stand here confident that tribal sovereignty, stewardship of lands and waters, inherent self-determination, are not merely conceptual, unrealistic pipe dreams for my nation, but that we are making great strides and that they are attainable in practice and made. Progress is painful, and walking into one fire after another has a way of singeing off your defenses and leaving you raw and angry. My hope each day for my people is that we walk through less of these fiery battles and feel more of the cool relief of equality and justice wash over us like currents of the sacred Penobscot River, which is home to our nation and the land we stand on right now. As a proud graduate of UMaine, I am honored to be here tonight. Please take my words as seeds to plant in your minds as you move about your life's work. I am thankful for all of that work and I look forward to more. In her book, Molly Molasses and Me, a collection of living adventures, the late Penobscot author, leader, and activist named Sipsis said, we are scavengers from the old times, being driven in the present, and riding on hopes into the future. We are native, 
and allow the spirit of ourselves to drive us on to the next sunset. Aguane is welcome to Penobscot territory. I wish you hope and truth in all of your quests for the next sunset. Mezendel Nabemnawak, all my relations. So uh, this is a bit of a come down from such eloquent words, but it is also very important for me to thank a number of funders and partners and participants that allowed this uh, three-day conference and particularly the festival and the keynote event at its center to come together. So essential funding was provided by the President's Office of the University of Maine, the Morton Kelly Charitable Trust, the Maine Humanities Council, the McGillicuddy Humanities Center, the Maine Folk Life Center, and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, all here at the University of Maine, as well as the Osher Map Library and the Smith Center for Cartographic Education at the University of Southern Maine. We also have a great partnership with the Maine Historical Society, which is holding its annual meeting uh, in conjunction with the conference on the University of Maine's campus. So I'd like to ask for a round of applause to thank our various partners. Uh, I also just have to thank the fleet of history graduate students who served as staff all throughout the conference, really not possible without all the <laughs> So just briefly, the format for tonight's keynote, we will have short presentations of about 10 to 15 minutes each by each of our speakers from this large fixed podium that cannot be moved. <laughs> And then the keynote speakers and I will sit at the table to my right and we'll have a follow-up conversation for about another 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll close with questions from the audience and as you know we are asking for those via Twitter at this point. I think we've already collected quite a number of questions on paper and by previous tweet and we will ask those toward the end of uh, tonight's keynote. So I want to give the briefest of introductions, uh, in part because all of the programs and flyers have a note, and I suspect that many of you are familiar with the work of Alan Taylor and Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. They are indeed two of the very most accomplished scholars of early American history of the past and current generation. And this is a very vital and rich field of historical scholarship. And it is no overstatement to say that they have both really blazed important trails and published multiple works of great nuance and insight and really stand as standard bearers of the historical profession. Um, both of them, too, have really had work very grounded, not just in the history of Maine, but the history of Maine in the statehood era. And so that they were both able to be with us for the conference and particularly to be at the center of tonight's keynote event is really a great gift to all of us and I'm delighted they both were able to make it. So Laurel Thatcher Ulrich is uh, recently retired from Harvard University. Alan Taylor is a professor of history at the University of Virginia. I am gonna let that stand as my opening remarks and we've decided that since Alan is a Maine native son, he is the appropriate person to be the first of our paired <laughs> keynote speakers tonight. So, Alan Taylor. What that means, I'm going to speak in my accent. <laughs> Tim Sample. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank Liam. Uh, I know how much hard work it is to organize a conference like this, and I cannot imagine anybody could do it better than Liam has.
And I also want to thank the graduate students who have been wonderfully engaging and helpful in every possible way. And I want to thank you for all turning out. This is impressive to have this many people gathered. Uh, I remember a few years ago, uh, I was in Philadelphia to give a presentation on the War of 1812. And the organizers were great optimists. So they had uh, booked a room at least this size, and 20 people showed up <laughs> and arranged themselves randomly among the 400 <laughs> seats. Uh, so I think for both Laurel and I, this is going to be quite nostalgic because we were both getting started in writing our books about Maine history at the same time. And, um, and what, what brought us together was a program called Maine at Statehood, which I know several other people in this uh, room are familiar with. So this is way back in the early 1980s. And at the time, I was a graduate student. I was from Maine. But I was feeling like a fish out of water going to a, a very advanced graduate program in Massachusetts at Brandeis University. And Liam was telling me earlier today that, that one of my uh, peers uh, subsequently said to Liam, I never would have predicted. I, I thought he was the least likely to succeed of all of us. <laughs> now, certainly a big part of it was my affect, because I was from rural Maine. Uh, but she also referred to my work as antiquarian, which, which I knew was code word for he works on Maine. Uh, so there was the perception by my peers that if you work on Maine, you're working on some quirky place that's peripheral to American history. And this has always been a point of pride with me. And I've got a, a friend of mine, uh, Patty Limerick, says she's going to form a peripheral studies association. <laughs> and I will be a charter member. Uh, but it also she was calling me antiquarian because of the reasons that had drawn me into history. I was interested in stories. I was interested in stories about people. And uh, I had become excited about history, reading some, frankly, very old-fashioned stuff that was narrative history. I mean, I'd, I'd read my Francis Parkman and Samuel Eliot Morrison and and I wanted to somehow update that and, and fit into that genre. But when I arrived at graduate school, the, the hot thing was the new social history at Brandeis. And uh, Beatrice Craig earlier today was saying she's very old fashioned because she counts things. Uh, well, it was very new fashioned at that time to count things in the particular way that the new social historians were doing. And it all came as a great revelation to me but a revelation that was both kind of enticing, but also daunting. Uh, and the, the new social history was very much moving away from characters in the past and putting the historian as the character at the center of the text. It was in many ways like modernist architecture. You're trying to show all of the components right out front, you're not trying to hide them behind a facade. So whereas the traditional narrative historian was very much the omniscient narrator and was trying to hide the fact that the narrator is there, the new social historian was putting himself, and it was mostly himself at that time, right at the center of the story of working with these local records in a statistical way to try to get at patterns of behavior by entire groups of people. And the, the, probably the three most influential books when I, when I was starting graduate school had both, all been published in 1970. They were all community studies of a Massachusetts town. It turns out American history happens in Massachusetts. <laughs> And by very talented historians, and one of them was one of my graduate student professors, John Demos, um, who was then at Brandeis before he went on to Yale. Uh, a little Commonwealth family life in Plymouth Colony. Second was Philip J. Grevin, Jr., four generations, population, land, and family in colonial Andover, Massachusetts. Uh, third was Kenneth A. Lockridge, a New England town, the first hundred years, Dedham, Massachusetts, 1636 to 1736. And all three of them, while they were working in quite specific places, were quite clear that these places, each one of them spoke for all of New England. And New England was the most important region 
in America. But they were also trying very much to get away from events, particularly political events, and to try to seek deep structures that could be found through quantitative analysis. And the hope was that by doing that, you were going to get much closer to the experience of ordinary people. So for example, John Demos wrote, quote, I contend that we have an excellent picture of Puritan worship for the highest level of the culture, the educated, the powerful, but nothing comparable for the average man. The problem in studying the latter group, of course, is that most of them were from the standpoint of history quite inarticulate. And so the effort was to go to probate inventories and parish records and town records, to count things and to do this over several generations in order to reveal what was thought to be the structures, the deep structures that change more slowly in history. And they're highly influenced by uh, Cambridge demographers, historical demographers, and also by the Annals School from France. Now, the, they conceived of these as structures as demographic, Long patterns and life cycles, patterns of births, marriages and deaths, as economic, through the production of the way of life and its reproduction through the generations, and also as cultural, as the transmission of a very deep traditional perspective. Now, I think the challenge for this was that the average man turns out to be a set of averages, uh, in that while names appear in these books, they are not developed as characters because they're trying to get well, they're trying to get into this deeper range of time and therefore they don't want to get, in their view, bogged down in the particulars of what's happening in individual lives. And it turns out that common women are especially uh, elusive in these particular books. It's, it's not by any sort of malign intent, it's just they forgot. <laughs> which again was characteristic of the time and it all seems like such a glaring oversight with our hindsight but at the time the thing I want to emphasize is that people just didn't see it so for example Philip Grevin's book he's so preoccupied with the relationship of Puritan fathers and sons that there's nothing about mothers and daughters his index contains 11 entries for father-son relationships and 73 under sons but mother, daughter, and woman don't even appear in the index. And again, it's, I'm, I'm not doing this just to pick on Philip Grevin, but to kind of identify the, an obliviousness that existed at the time. Now, I did find that this was challenging in that I very much wanted to get away from the elitism of traditional narrative history that just focused on the great men. And I was intrigued by a set of methods that could get you at the experiences of ordinary people. But I hoped that there was some way by which you could talk about particular people changing over time in ways that are showing these structures without them just being statistical averages. And then I found a book that was very helpful on this, and it was Robert Gross's A Minute Men in Their World, uh, which was published in 1976. And for example, he takes the story of, of Lucy Barnes and Joseph Hosmer. She's the teenage daughter of a prosperous farmer, and he is a very poor cabinet maker. His, her father refused to countenance the marriage she gets pregnant, then they get married. Then there's the twist in the story, the analysis that Gross brings in. Quote, Lucy's case was not unique. In the 20 years before the revolution, more than one out of every three firstborn children had been conceived out of wedlock. In the process, the young people subverted their parents' authority. So what he had done is he'd done all the same kind of close, research and analysis of these local records. He'd found a pattern and then he found particular people whose lives fit in that pattern and uses them to draw the reader into the general conclusions. And that's what I wanted to do. 
and then, uh, because my early career needed all the help it could get, uh, I was dis I either discovered or somebody discovered uh, that I was doing Maine history, which made me a great rarity at the time in academic circles. And the Maine Humanities Council was just launching Maine at Statehood, which was right exactly in the center of, of what I was doing. And it began, as I recall, uh, with an event in Portland at the Maine Historical Society, and I'm put on a panel, first panel I've ever been on, and I'm seated next to Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, who I'm meeting for the first time. And I have to say, it was an extremely uh, eye-opening experience for me. Uh, I did not know Laurel's work. She just published her first book the year before. And uh, as, as soon as I was done with that, I went and read her book and found out she was doing for women many of the same things that, that Robert Gross had done in The Minutemen in Their World, in that human characters are at the center of the story, but they reveal patterns that are more than, far more than antiquarian. So just to conclude, uh, Laurel and I had the opportunity to exchange work and I, have to, uh, I had an excellent graduate mentor at Brandeis, but he was not somebody who knew the archival sources in Maine. And he was not somebody who was then engaged in kind of the, the deep engagement with how do you interpret these records from the past that seem so overtly mute in order to draw out the humanity that lies behind those records. And in my opinion, nobody does this better than Laurel does. And my opportunity to read her draft work that would go into becoming a midwife's tale played a larger role in my thinking of what it is, how it is possible to be a historian at the very highest level of writing and thinking and human engagement with the past that has been absolutely essential to my being able to move into this profession. So I'm very grateful to be here today and to be part of this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Liam. Thanks to all of you for being here and for all of those who have made this possible. Uh, I'm going to share some similar stories in a way because as Alan suggested, he and I came into the profession roughly at the same time. I had finished my dissertation and it had been published but I didn't have the advantage of having read uh, Morrison and all of those books. I wasn't interested in history at all. I was interested in being a writer and I had been an English major and actually never took a history course, even though I had an MA in English. By the time I went to the University of New Hampshire and signed up for Charlie Clark's um, seminar on the historical writings of early America. And, and really, Charlie, in a real way, made me see history in a new way. I had been thinking about doing something else, and before I knew it, I was in, as a part-time faculty wife, I was in a PhD program in uh, early American history. Now, I had a certain, uh, I, I was born in a little town in Idaho. And as I think about my way of thinking about history, I sort of had two uh, great American myths that were working sort of in opposite ways in my life. One, of course, was the myth of the pioneer. And I was descended on all sides from um, people who had 
travel the Mormon Trail to the Great Salt Lake Valley in the 19th century. He was born in 1938, and the centennial of, you know, this is the place, here we are in the valley of the Great Salt Lake, was celebrated in 1947, so I was just at that age, the heroic pioneer. I didn't feel very heroic myself, and actually, I thought the pioneer world sounded pretty interesting, but my little tiny Mormon town wasn't all that interesting. And what I liked to do was read. And in that reading, and from elementary school through high school, I got another great American myth, and that is a similar myth, in a way, that Alan got. And, and that is, it all happened in New England. Um, I loved my American history class in high school, and my teacher came with slides of her visits to New England. Um, and I sometimes joked that as I was growing up, um, on Thanksgiving Day, our family would be in the car driving through the sage-covered moonscape of southeastern Idaho, singing over the river and through the woods <laughs> to grandmother's house we go. So when my husband um, got uh, admitted to Massachusetts Institute of Technology to do his PhD in chemical engineering, I was really thrilled and very excited to be in the heart of culture and the heart of all great things. And then when my husband moved me and our then four children to Durham, New Hampshire when he took a faculty position in 1970 at this little New England town, I wasn't so sure that I was ready to leave uh, the vibrant uh, cities of Boston and Cambridge, and I looked around for something to do. And this was, um, I'd really been influenced by the nascent feminist movement in the early 70s and had managed to get myself to the point where I had a sort of a life plan. I was going to continue my education in a part-time basis, and I ended up in Charlotte Clark's seminar and discovered a very, very, very different kind of pioneering, a different kind of frontier. Charlie was a narrative historian. I read his book, The Eastern Frontier, about Maine and New Hampshire. Charlie, as some of you remember him, was a Mainer, a Bates graduate, and he made that story come alive, and I realized historians were writers, too. And that really changed my life, and I finished my dissertation uh, doing something um, it's sort of impossible, um, which was writing a history of women without any women's sources. Um, Goodwives was, I had to find the women, literally sift them out from lots and lots and lots of sources that ostensibly ignored them. The, the richest were court records. Captivity narratives mentioned women as suffering victims and other things. Sermons mentioned them occasionally. But these were the fundamental sources that I had to work with and teasing the story out of those materials. I think maybe I had uh, one, one or two um, short pieces of paper in a woman's handwriting. The one thing I did have was the poetry of Anne Bradstreet. Um, so I wrote that book, um, Good Wives, um, image and reality in the lives of women in northern New England from 1650 to 1750. 
and then I finished the PhD, I got a publisher, the book was published, my husband was still on the faculty, I then had five children, I wasn't going to go anywhere, and I was given a part-time job in the humanities program at UNH, and the director of the program went away for a year, and Charlie Clark stepped in, and we became office mates once a week or so when we'd talk about this program and he said, you know, there's this program that the Humanities Council in Maine is doing about Maine and statehood. And I think this was 1983. And I gave them your name and I thought maybe you might be interested. And I was very interested. And I'll, I'll never forget that wonderful meeting at the Historical Society and staying in a hotel and have a wonderful reception and sitting behind, beside this graduate student from Brandeis. And <laughs> he said to me, uh, you know, in the quiet way Alan does now, I understand you're interested in the diary of Martha Moore Ballard. I had found that diary at the Maine State Library. And, and before I went to that meeting and, um, and mentioned in the introduction, I was beginning to work on this fabulous 27-year diary. Uh, and he said, um, has she said much about the assaults on her husband when he was surveying for the great proprietors? And I said, oh, I don't think so. I really haven't noticed that. And then I went home <laughs> and in exact entries in the diary where I had been meticulously searching for information on childbirth. There was a story of the assault by the great proprietors. And so meeting Alan was such, I mean, we didn't know, I didn't know this was gonna be a mutual admiration society, but actually meeting Alan was transformative for me. Um, for Number one, I had also been trained somewhat by a quantifier, Derek Rutman, who was very good and very critical of the same people that Alan was talking about. He also was a good writer. Um, but I was really scared of it. And I remember as Alan and I became friends because we were always hanging out in the you know, state archives or the county courthouse or someplace in Augusta and we'd go get sandwiches together and we'd compare notes. And I remember the day he sort of helped me figure out how to make a stem chart from a tax list. So I could figure out how Ephraim Ballard, where Ephraim Ballard stood. And I'd been doing a lot of sort of quantitative stuff with the diary because I needed to count the deliveries. I needed to do that kind of work. I'd been trained to do that. But I was afraid of a lot of the political and in economic stuff. And Alan was much better prepared with that than I was and was extremely helpful. And we compared notes constantly. The world of Ephraim Ballard, the world of Martha Ballard, were very different. Our books are very different. We're telling different stories. But I, it's not an accident that we began to work together. And it's not an accident because of the brilliance of the historical leaders in the state of Maine who managed to win a very competitive and quite lucrative grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. I think Kevin Murphy was one of the writers of that and the other people at the Humanities Council that many of you know. And what a gift as you're beginning a project to meet somebody 
who you can learn from. Um, it's a great gift. It's why we have conferences. It's why we go to meetings like this. But that was more than networking because they kept wanting us to publish things. And they wanted us to give papers. And they wanted us to go into the public and communicate. So, so I met so many of you in this room. I began to talk to people in the museum field. Um, and began to learn about different kinds of sources in small historical societies in the state of Maine that continue to, continues to feed my work to this day. As a matter of fact, all four of my sort of major uh, works in early American history deal with Maine in some significant way, including the last one on Mormon pioneers, who would have thought? So um, I share um, in this celebration of this conference, which in some ways I think is a celebration of something that started 30 years ago and just keeps on going and giving. So thank you. So a little rearranging of the microphones and our setting. Uh, I get to play Dick Cavett for a little while, and then we're going to take questions that have been submitted previously by tweet or paper from the audience. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here with Alan and Laurel and have a chance to ask them some follow-up questions. And I guess I want to start, of, of course, part of their great accomplishment as historians is that they have published so broadly. And they do both have these remarkable books about Maine and the statehood era published in 1990. But they then have both gone on to publish a remarkable range of additional work. But I do want to start with the two main books, since here we are. And so in this bicentennial moment, giving you a reason to think back again about these, you know, the work that went into books that were then published in 1990. How do they perhaps, how does this moment lead you to reflect a bit differently about Liberty Man and Great Proprietors and Martha Ballard and her diary uh, from now almost 30 years since that initial publication? Um, how do I think differently now, 30 years later? Um, <laughs> I guess what I would say, and I was telling Alan actually before um, we began this evening, I mean, I've, um, Martha Ballard is a gift that keeps on giving <laughs> to me. I mean, I'll never write anything that is quite so successful. And so it's kind of hard for me to think about it as anything but a kind of miracle <laughs> that, I, that I had the privilege of stumbling onto this diary. Um, I'm totally in awe of archives and primary source material and how totally dependent historians are. And I really want to emphasize, you know, I, people thought Martha Ballard's diary was trivial and uninteresting. It wasn't trivial and uninteresting to me because I had written an entire book with nothing in a woman's <laughs> handwriting. If I had come from the 20th, or the 19th century to Martha Ballard's diary, I would have thought it's very terse and maybe not very interesting. But I came from the 17th century to Martha's diary. And, it, and that diary seems to me a kind of miracle. It, it, it's really the earliest American detailed account, not just of midwifery, but of healing um, and then incorporating house um, household economy and sexuality and many of the many of the questions that these early social historians were asking and wanting to understand 
but having a primary source where somebody's really telling you your story. So where I come down today is in the importance of archivists and individual family members and individuals preserving historical records and providing access in whatever form they might be. And in, in my own career, I've gone sort of berserk on that because I include artifacts uh, as well as documents. And it's kind of a long answer, but uh, that's a heartfelt one. Mm -hmm. well, well, both Laurel and I, I think, are at our, among our happiest when we're in an archive. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And uh, sometimes this is hard to explain to normal people. Uh, uh, and, and I have the experience, I, I come out of the archive, it takes me a while to re-engage with <laughs> being social with other human beings who aren't living in the 18th century. Um, I, I think that there, there is a risk now when so much stuff, and, and this is not this is not being a curmudgeon here entirely. Uh, there's so much stuff that's available online. There's a temptation that many people have, particularly outside the academy, but also a, a fair number of graduate students to think you, from your home you can get access to all that you basically need. And for some projects you probably can because there is so much that's out there. Yeah. Uh, but there is always even more that's in an archive. And I fear, you know, that this conviction that everything that's valuable is being put online is influencing state legislators and other people who allocate money uh, to think that, that maybe archives um, aren't that relevant anymore. And uh, I, it's not possible to put everything online. And particularly if you want to get at the experiences of ordinary people. Uh, you, you really need to have access to the archives. Yeah. So that, that's one point. Second thing that I, want, I wanted to say is that uh, Charlie Clark, his father was a congregational minister, and he was a congregational minister in the town that I grew up in. Oh, <laughs> really? right. oh my goodness. All right, so there is that, that connection. But, but to what's changed, what, what I think is, when I reflect back on, on Liberty Men and Great Proprietors, there's a lot in there about people dressing up as Indians, but there's almost nothing about Native peoples in there. <laughs> And uh, again, that was a kind of a classic blind spot of that time, which was if you did Native American history, you were some sort of specialized subfield. You weren't doing American history, which this sounds utterly absurd now, uh, but that's the point, is that it has it is changed in ways. And the efforts made by this conference to incorporate um, the Native perspective and uh, Native American interaction with settler peoples is at the very heart of the story is something that I applaud. But it's something that would not have happened in a conference if, well, when we met in 1983, for example. Mm -hmm. And artifacts. And, you know, when I started, when I did the book at the Age of Homespun, which I, I gave the wrong name to that book, by the way, um, We'll talk about that later if you want. But it's, it's a book about artifacts, and nearly every chapter deals with indigenous artifacts, mm -hmm. as well as with, and with the context of um, the, the conquest, the European mm -hmm. conquest. The age of homespun was not sweet, spinning wheel kind of colonial history but it was dangerous and, and conflict. But it was also the material productions, things we heard today in wonderful session, canoes, baskets, different kinds of textiles were made, gorgeous textiles. And so that push to try to find sources that could teach about women continues today, and very, very important. And the artifacts um, are part of that story. So let me pick up on that. Uh, we've heard the emergence of an awareness of, oh, women do need to be part of history. And there's no question that a 
pressing consciousness of indigenous issues now pervades early American history. Mm -hmm. And we are aware that objects are crucial sources of information, untapped, that tell us all sorts of things that we didn't know. And I think this is a puzzle to non-historians that history changes. And, and I think this is really a big revelation to a lot of people as they, perhaps as they become history majors, but certainly as they become graduate students, how could studying the past possibly be dynamic? And so you know, I wonder beyond those three examples if there are other ways to, you know, how do you describe the dynamism of doing early American history? I mean, it's a bit of a puzzle or conundrum. Um, well, we were talking earlier, I, I think, about um, what happens when we're talking about something long ago and we get a hand in the audience, as I did on the interview on the main public radio. Actually, the interview asked me, how do we, you know, you described this rape case in Hollowell, Maine in the 18th century in a midwife's tale. What do you think about the Me Too movement today? And this immediately going to the, to the contemporary question, I think that's actually fabulous. I, I almost never hear a news broadcast but what I think back at some of the historical projects that I've worked on, not that they're going to be the same or that they're going to give me answers to help me understand, but they can help me get at some of the transcending human dilemmas that grow out of particular situations that we, we, we don't repeat the past. We can't repeat the past. I mean, that old notion, those who don't know the past are destined to repeat it. And some say you absolutely can't because the, the context is changing momentarily, constantly. But we do, re, we do repeat patterns. We do repeat behaviors. And, and I think that's one of our real challenges today is to help people know more about history so we can be a little more thoughtful about the fact that we're making history every moment of our lives in a kind of unconscious way. Um, yeah, I, I, I think our role is that we're interpreters between a past and people in the present, and people in the present are always changing. So yeah. we, we have we're engaged in this cultural communication across generations to try to make sense of the past for people who live in the present, and that means that that history evolves. And I think that the great value of history it gives you depth perception in time for where you are now mm -hmm. and what you have to deal with in the world you live in. And we were talking about this before, that we, we, we both do a lot of presentations to um, a general public audiences. And invariably, uh, there are question sessions afterwards. And, and they want to ask about contemporary issues and how history informs what we think about that. And I'll, you know, I, I, I do it with a little bit of trepidation um, because um, I don't all know as much about the present as I should do uh, to weigh in on some of the things I'm being asked to weigh in on. But it is, it shows that there is, that, that people do care about history and they want to know, they want to be able to situate themselves and they want to be able to situate the very fraught moment that we are in our history in this country right now in some longer perspective. And it's, I think, our obligation. We can't retreat from that. We have to engage with that. As, as historians particularly, um, I work at a public university. You work for a public yeah. university for a yeah. long time. And, 
And there is a real danger that uh, academics will become disconnected from the, the people who support the institutions we work for. And it's important that we not allow that to happen to the degree that we can, can do anything about it. Yeah, but I think a lot of the way that um, public discourse deals with history is to try to use history to predict. Okay, so in these five examples in the past, this was the outcome, and therefore that tells us what we should do now. Um, and you can pick your examples. They're on, in the newspaper today, I'm sure. You will find similar ones. And I don't think that's the way history works. Um, you know, mentioning the Me Too movement, I mean, one of the things I could say, because the, every single book that I've worked on has had some kind of horrendous abuse. Um, and so one thing I learned from that is, this isn't new, folks. This isn't new. Um, and that's really useful. That's a very simple lesson, but it's a really useful lesson because sometimes we do, you know, we imagine everything good comes out of New England or everything good well, it comes does out, come out of, of Maine. Pioneer, or everything <laughs> comes out of Maine. Right. Yeah. Everything bad comes it's out, out of Maine. Out of Massachusetts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just well, joking, I'm a Red Sox fan. So. We'll, we'll test this theory when we turn to the audience questions and see what sort of contemporary <laughs> prognostication you get asked to do. I, I do, I'll add my own little footnote is that I do think studying history is a training in humility. And we really constantly discover how people's intended actions lead to incredibly different consequences. And I'm, so I'm that the sense that you could I'm use history to have a model and predict yeah. is not something that many historians uh, right. follow up on. Yeah. So let me shift the conversation a little bit and return to both of your uh, eloquent commitment to archives and to traditional paper archives. And this is certainly something that I think all historians share, you know, when you're in an archive doing research, it is a world of possibility and connection, and you're imagining where you can go with this material. But what sets the two of you apart from me is that you then write about it in a way that realizes those possibilities. And, and that is a enormous transition from love of archive, working hard collecting that material, and then how you craft it. And again, in not just high quality work, but an in incredible productivity on both of your parts. So I'd like to learn a little bit about your writing process, maybe how that's changed over time, or maybe how you have tackled it. I'll say three words. <laughs> revise, revise, revise. That's my process. I write really crappy first drafts. It's really hard work. I don't always enjoy it. But if I can get that crappy first draft down, I actually like revising. Mm -hmm. And I do multiple revisions. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not surprised to find that I you know, entirely agree with Laura. Uh, the, the great curse of uh, any particularly new scholar is perfectionism. And to think <laughs> that the first draft, if you don't like that sentence, you don't like that paragraph, you just cross it out and then you start over. Uh, you should write as much crap as fast as you possibly can. <laughs> that, that is the secret. It absolutely is. Because you get your ideas down on paper and then you can figure out you know, what's worth saving, what's worth moving, and what's worth getting rid of. And most of it you want to get rid of. Uh, and the very best writing is not writing, it's editing. <laughs> and it's, ah, that's right. you, you have to go through multiple drafts. And, and like Laurel, I, I like this. I mean, I could be a much more efficient writer if I could just write a good first draft, but it's not possible <laughs> for me. And I'm not sure you know, it's possible for, for the vast majority of people. So just write, write as much as you can, and then go and, and reorganize it and rewrite it. 
the, the other thing I would say that, that, that I think both Laurel and I have in common is we're primarily we're interested in people, people's lives, yeah. uh, rather than abstractions. Yes. Now, there's a lot of wonderful work that begins with abstractions and stays with abstractions, and, I've been, and we've both benefited from that work, but it's, yeah. it's not the kind of work that really interests me. So I am interested in things like republicanism or uh, the early history of racism, and, but I want to get at it through telling the stories of particular people who experience these things or who think these things in order to get at them. And I think that that's, that's a hallmark of what we do. And there's another point about that. I mean, because some people want, you know, an opposition between narrative history and analytical history. Um, but the kind of storytelling, narrative, people-centered kind of history that Alan and I like to do definitely has arguments. It's that they emerge, they're, they're more subtle arguments, but they emerge within the story, within the story. And the, the thing about telling something that really happened is y you can capture the complexity of the, the topic that you're working on and in, in ways that are really hard to do if you have to put it in a topic sentence. So I wonder, uh, a sort of another version of that commitment to a focus on people and mm -hmm. recovering and realizing those people is that in both of your work, there's a strong commitment to immediate local context. And that can, is clearly a strength of both of your work, but it also can be a weakness mm -hmm. And how that transition from a very individual story, a very local story, that is human and universal, mm -hmm. but again, I think the craft of writing and explaining and setting that localized into a broader context is a, is a real skill that I'd yeah. love to hear more from either of you about. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, d I don't know. Okay. Um, we are a lot of alike here, and so we should have, you know, I had a colleague who um, never, never revised, he was a great writer, <laughs> and it was very, very different. So I don't want anybody to think, you know, you have to do it the way I do it or the way Alan does it. And, and there are great analytical writers. Um, so what was your question? <laughs> the local. How do you the local. use and the transcend local. the local? Can you write about Maine? You know, that comes out of my coming from a small town going to the city to a state university in another state and, and, and hearing all the jokes about people from Idaho. <laughs> you know, I just developed... There are jokes about people from yeah, Idaho? Yeah, yeah, it's like, but people from Maine. <laughs> <laughs> Idaho is to Utah what Maine is to Massachusetts, okay? So, um, there's a kind of defiance there about wanting to show that the local and the unimportant is where it's really, really at. And, and a lot of, a, a real way that is often true in terms of publication. I mean, one thing that happened, there was no, um, um, well, maybe I'll use my Idaho example. I mean, I don't know how many great works of history you can think of off the top of your head that are set in Idaho, which makes me think that should be my next project. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. well, well, I do think it, what's helpful is to not think about the local as, the, as antithetical to the national or the international but that indeed people's lives are affected by different scales of experience. So 
William Cooper lives in Cooperstown, New York and he's a land speculator, and it's a, it's a story that's very contextual for that particular environment. But land speculation is something that's playing out through the whole country, and the creation of new private property through the dispossession of native peoples and the reallocation of it through these market mechanisms is something that constructs uh, the social order of the United States over time, and the political order takes shape through this extension of these processes across the continent. And all of this is influenced by international processes that are bringing yeah. people yeah. from the different corners of the globe. So you can't always write about all those things at the same time, so you have to pick and choose what, what you will write about. But I think it's helpful if you keep in mind that whatever slice you're doing into a bit of the past and whatever geography you want to work on, that it is a selection process and you want to be aware of when you uh, may want to just shift to another scale of analysis just to explain why this particular local setting is very germane to people who want to understand something on a different scale of historical analysis. Yeah, that's one of the reasons artifacts can be so very, very interesting. You get a piece of it coming from one place, um, I, I was just reading, I think, in the Times or the Washington Post today about the problem with tariffs is that making a very complex um, electronic component, um, something comes from one place, is partially manufactured in another, moves on to another place, and I immediately thought of textile production in the 18th century. I mean, you take something that looks very local, um, where does vanilla come from? Uh, you're going to make ice cream. You've got to be someplace with ice. You've got to be someplace with cows. Where does the vanilla come from for the vanilla ice cream? Where does the sugar come from? And then almost anything that you take that's sitting in front of you, if you want to, you can build this broader and broader context around it. Intellectually, even if you don't spin that out in your total narrative, if you're always conscious of that, it's going to shape the way you interpret and the way you tell the story. And it's fun to tell, you know, there are interesting books. I'm, I'm thinking of the, a John Demos book. Where does my story begin? It mm. might be here might be there, it might be here. I think maybe apropos of that, I'm going to switch over to some questions from the audience. And I am not a Twitter person, so it gives me great delight to say this is a question that has come from Twitter. <laughs> uh, Sifferly Good, who is the curator at the Penobscot Marine Museum and also is a presenter at the festival this afternoon, would like to know about a specific object that has helped you to tell your stories. So you have to pick one, one favorite object. One, what is a specific object? Like one favorite object that you Oh, a grappled favorite. With. Yes, yeah. favorite object. Not objects. Hard for in you. General. You've worked with so many objects. So <laughs> it's all your children are equal, right? <laughs> you know, all favorite. my children are. I love whatever. Right. I mean, I'm especially fond of Harvard's 178 year old tortilla. Uh -huh. okay. It's pretty fabulous. It's in the Bota Economic Botany Collection. Came from Mexico. Um, I think I should mention one that I intended to mention in my introductory remarks, but didn't get there. Um, and that would be um, the uh, wonderful Molly Ocket pocketbook mm -hmm. at the Maine State Museum. And I think probably most of you in this room are familiar with that, mm -hmm. but it's a very important um, to me, chapter in the age of homespun. And, and it illustrates this larger point. So Maria got the um, complex story, which I won't tell here, but an Abnaki woman who made um, a, a twined pocketbook for a local gunsmith. So that object was a European form. It was exactly like a pocketbook that would have come from England or would have been made from 
one of her English speaking neighbors that had a lining that had to probably reuse silver clasp. It was the shape and the fold over. But the technique she used to produce the fabric was ancient, really virtually lost method of twining from local bast fiber ornamented with dyed moose hair. Really delicate work. So to me, it was such an emblem of an intercultural encounter. And it was an encounter laced with stories of violence. Uh, absolutely, if you know her, her life story but also of survival and a capacity for some kind of healing and exchange between two people coming together from very, very different worlds. And that exchange is embedded in the artifact. The artifact I'm going to pick out is one that I actually haven't written about, um, but which was influential in that what it was, um, I. I I got to meet descendants of James Fenimore Cooper and William Cooper, and they were very helpful to me. And uh, one descendant was a man named Henry Cooper, who uh, for many years wrote for the New Yorker magazine. And he had inherited um, this organ that had belonged uh, to the Cooper family. Uh, and it was produced in Philadelphia in the 1790s, and it was hauled uh, during the winter up to Cooperstown, New York, and it caused a sensation, and everybody in the village would, would come and listen outside the window, because they'd never experienced anything like this. And uh, the, the equivalent of CDs that they had were the, were the wooden rolls like this, and then it looked like there were staples <laughs> on it. And if you put this in and you turned the crank, it would play a particular tune, like Hail Columbia. And he had about a dozen of these roles, and each one would play a different song. And he had repaired this thing, and then he created a tape of it, of all of the songs on that, and he gave it to me. So that whenever I was getting, uh, you know, struggling to write, I would just put this in my cassette player and listen. I could be listening to the same music that James <laughs> Fenimore Cooper and William Cooper and Hannah Cooper and the whole family were listening to, and it just put me in the mood. <laughs> So uh, another question from the audience, and I think I'll direct this one to Alan to start because he has written a whole book on this subject, uh, or most of a book on this subject, and it comes from the Wabanaki Center, and they ask, what are some examples you have found of how and by whom land was taken from indigenous people? Well, I, I've worked on this subject not in Maine, but in what is now New York and in Upper Canada, so working um, on the experience of Haudenosaunee people in particular. And um, it, it's a complex process, and it's one it, which is powerfully insidious because it operates in so many different ways. Uh, so we overtly think, well, military force. And military force and violence is, is always there in the background. But the actual instruments of, of parting native peoples from their land is often done in ways that can be described overtly as peaceful. Uh, and it involves um, trying to distort native processes of governance in ways that break up the consensual ideal and uh, promote factionalism and create rewards for certain factions to work at the expense of other factions. Uh, processes of uh, indebtedness, of introducing certain market incentives and then distorting those market incentives in ways that work to the detriment of native people, so the one resource they're left with by which they can uh, try to get out of these, these burdensome debts. Uh, is to part with the lands. Uh, also, people who, uh, who will come into the community uh, from outside and our uh, local native peoples hope that these people will serve as uh, advisors to them and help to protect their interests. Uh, but often as these cascading processes are, are increasing their pressure, some of these people then become wedges themselves and open up and broker these deals in ways that serve their own particular interests. So it, it's, it's a very complex process and 
and one that, of course, has enormous local variation. Uh, so I don't want to profess to be an expert in exactly how it worked here. But I have seen these processes working um, the way I found them to work uh, in the Haudenosaunee experience elsewhere. Just say in my own experience of reading this book, The Divided Ground, that Alan wrote, I mean, it was the, the rapaciousness of New England, uh, New York government officials at the local and state level was just breathtakingly shocking. Well, there's also this pernicious doctrine uh, that uh, underlies the law to this point, which is the preemption doctrine, which is the notion that Native peoples don't truly own their land in the eyes of the law. Uh, and therefore, governments, non-native governments, can sell preemption rights to people who then it's in their interest to use hook and by crook to get native peoples off of that land. Uh, and that legal doctrine has been one of the most destructive things at um, depriving native peoples of their lands. As a follow-up and sort of circling back to that issue of sort of contemporary political issues and how being an early American story reflects on it, am I right that you, part of divided ground came out of Oneida land claim legal action? And mm -hmm. might you say a little bit about that and what it would be li like to be, I presume, expert witness or somehow involved? I'm not oh. sure how. Um. I had, I had started working on um, Mahican peoples who had moved into the into Haudenosaunee uh, territory. And so I was contacted by lawyers for the Oneida Nation of New York to ask if I would be willing to help them um, in a land claims case against the state of New York. And after talking with them and, and being persuaded of, of what they wanted to do, uh, I, I agreed. And, it's, it's very eye-opening because the law is an intellectual discipline that operates by different rules than we do. And uh, so, but, so when you're playing on their turf, you have to play by their rules. So I remember I was being deposed by an adverse lawyer who, after they'd read my report, and asked me a question, and I started my answer in the kind of classic way that we do. I say, well, it's complex, and he says, <laughs> answer my question, you know, and he got quite angry with me. Um, uh, I'm not going to sit here and listen to you. Uh, so it, it is an adversarial process. They play by certain rules, and uh, I didn't entirely know the rules. Uh, so uh, it, it was, it was a, in some ways, a frustrating experience. That particular aspect of, the, of it was, but it was something that was very eye-opening uh, for me to understand how the law works better than I, I did, and to understand how um, historically it has largely worked to the detriment of Native peoples, but how there are uh, very creative efforts now to try to use the law in ways that can uh, recover Native rights. There are there two people in the audience who are very active in the Bethel Historical Society. Oh. And Molly Ockett has been a sort of complex central figure for many white people in yeah. Bethel. That's right. And you've mentioned this extraordinary twined pocketbook that she made. Also that her life was very much shaped by violence and dispossession. Oh, yeah. So just to return to Molly and talk about that place. So. Well, in a way, it sounds familiar when we think about some of the things that are happening around us today. Uh, what do you do if you're caught in the middle of a war and just don't want to participate? <laughs> And we see a lot of the refugees today. It's a situation. I, I'm, I'm, I just can't do it. And so Molly's people um, came to the main government in the middle of a conflict, you know, the, one of the perennial colonial wars, New France, English, uh, competing, indigenous groups of various kinds. I mean, we don't, we don't really want to participate in this. Um, 
if we just promise not to be involved, can you just protect us? Um, and so they had the bright idea of protecting them by um, moving them down onto an island in Boston Harbor where they, you know, almost starved and then moved them from there. And so they were displaced. They were displaced persons in a difficult situation in Massachusetts where they were not welcome. Um, and the alternative was to go into an untenable situation. They'd lost their own land base and was in contention in a war. And, and Molly did learn some English there, which then became very useful to her because their prior encounters with Europeans had been with her friends. And so the war ends and there, you know, she comes back. But, but that's part of the context for what happened to her. But I, I can't imagine that the story of any individual who lived through the 18th century um, in the eastern frontier was not scarred terribly by war. I mean, one of the things that astounded me as I looked at historical records from local historical societies is how many records there are of digging up bones. I mean, where people are plowing in battlefields. So we circled back to some contemporary issues after all, from court cases to the yeah. presence of displaced people and refugees is a very contemporary moment that obviously yeah. has yeah. powerful resonance in early American history as well. I think I'm gonna close with a question from the audience and draw us back to our statehood moment. So this will be our final question. And it's a very specific question that I'm gonna broaden just slightly. So. Uh, and I, so I think this probably comes from someone active in a local historical society and thinking about how are we going to position ourselves for the bicentennial. So the specific question is, what are the best sources for finding out about town debates over statehood? And maybe I'll just broaden that slightly to ask, you know, what would your suggestions be to the person in the history room of the local library, the person running a local historical society, the person committed to family genealogy and, and that, how to approach and think about and search out material about the broad statehood era from the 1780s through the 1820s. Well, if, if they're specifically looking for debates, um, I don't think there's you know, anything better than the newspapers um, in that those are forums for people to be fancying quite persuasive writing um, and to be engaging in arguments meant to counter whatever other side they imagine themselves countering. Um, but I think a, a lot of times the political, I mean, Laurel knows this from reading these much more ballads. The, the political is, is a small part of people's lives. Now, the political is very important and it frames certain possibilities. Um, but there's a lot more going on in these towns and in these families and, and in individual lives than the political moment of separation. So other things that are worth thinking about is how, how did people deal with the environment they lived in given the technology that they had? Uh, how do they fulfill their goals as as um, families, giving a, a very demanding environment? Um, uh, yeah, I, I I agree. And one strategy for doing that, and actually, you mentioned Bethel. Um, Bethel Historical Society is uh, come into my work not not just because of um, Molly Ockett, but my. I have a number of Maine emigres, people who left Maine um, and went elsewhere in um, A House Full of Females, the, the book that I published in 2017, including 
quite a bunch from Bethel. And I, I know the Bethel Historical Society has a little file on you know, what happened when the Mormon missionaries came through Bethel. But one of the things that's fascinated me this weekend as I've listened to the papers is thinking about Patty Sessions, who was a midwife, um, who kept a diary much like Martha Ballard's diary. In generations, she would have been Martha Ballard's granddaughter. But she began her career in Bethel, Maine, and she ended it in Utah. And where did she go? In 1837, with her husband, her remaining children, many had died in a terrible epidemic in Maine. Her son, who was married, and his wife. Where did she go in 1837? Missouri. The Latter-day Saints were in Missouri from 1832 to 1838. Um, it was not happy. It was not pleasant. Um, they were burned out of Jackson County because they were New Englanders and slave owners there thought they were going to proselyte among their slaves. They were eventually driven out of the state under an order that they must be exterminated. Uh, it was pretty horrible, and they ended up as refugees in Illinois. So Patty Sessions left Maine in the wake of maybe declining economic fortunes, she and her family, in the, in the wake of having suffered through cholera and typhus and lost a number of her children. She went off to Missouri. Um, and uh, was thrown out of that state. But I think, it, really, I've been thinking the whole weekend, the main story is not just in Maine. And how do I know a lot of this about the deaths of her children? Not because I went back and did primary research, but because she kept a diary in a refugee camp on the Missouri River and near what is Omaha, Nebraska, because her son composed the genealogy and told about these deaths. These people who were in a terrible situation were thinking about their cold, mountainous home in Maine, and they began to reminisce and write about it. So I expect you could learn an awful lot about Maine history outside <laughs> of Maine. And it would be kind of fun to do some family history and see what you could turn up. So let me close tonight by uh, teasing each of our distinguished speakers just a little bit from a uh, humane perspective. They, uh, Alan unfortunately went to Colby College for his undergraduate degree instead of coming to Orono. <laughs> Laurel unfortunately went to our hockey rival UNH. Where did you go to school, Liam? Get her doctor. <laughs> I, I, I went to the land grant university in my home state of California, okay. so okay. I, I feel like I'm on okay ground here. But we can write this balance okay. because I have UMaine history department baseball caps Aww. for both okay. of you. Great. Okay. So to keep off black flies, right? right. So as long as you promise to wear these hats at the reunions of your schools, our uh, balance will be squared. So we owe a great debt to Laurel Thatcher Ulrich and Alan Taylor for coming here, but particularly for their scholarship and their continued work into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I will just mention in my endless promotion of the Maine Bicentennial Conference, it continues tomorrow at 8.30 a.m., three more panels, all in Wells Conference Center. You are all welcome to come, and if you are attracted by free food, as I often am, we will have breakfast at 8 and the first panel starting at 8.30. Thank you very much, and have a very good evening.